Okay, I promise this will be the last theory crafting video I do for a while. I know I've been kind of going really heavy on the topic lately, but I'm only doing this video because I kind of promised I would, uh, because the uh, the fixing the hero ships video did fairly well, and I said I would do the non-Federation ships if it did. So, here we are. Okay, starting off with the Romulan ships, first is the Talis class Warbird, aka the old Romulan Bird of Prey from the original series. And honestly, they did a pretty good job of capturing the vibe of this of this ship with the legendary Talis, which is available through the legendary Romulan Captain's Bundle, I think it's called. Uh, yeah, but the, you know, they, they gave that thing an enhanced battle cloak. Uh, it's an Intel it's an Intel ship with a Lieutenant Commander uh, command seat, uh, so you can do a decent torpedo on it. So torpedo build on it, so that way you can do like a heavy plasma torpedo build on it you know really stealthy bomber type stuff exactly what this ship is meant for so yeah no notes on that one just it's the legendary to list. The Dideridex, however, could definitely use a bit of a touch-up. Uh, I do like that they went with Miracle Worker on the legendary version of this one. I do feel like that fits the vibe fairly well. You could argue for other specializations instead, but that's going to be kind of true for pretty much every ship on this list. But this being a big, bulky ship that's been seen doing all sorts of different tasks throughout Star Trek, I feel like Miracle Worker for fits really well for it. But at the same time, the ship is kind of meant to be like the flagship of the Romulan fleet, so I think Command makes a good secondary for it. I always thought it was weird that they gave it temporal on the legendary version um additionally i would give it a five through weapons layout because this is me of course i would but i mean at the same time look at that wingspan this thing was not designed as a broadsider this thing was meant to shoot weapons forward more so than to the side so five three and, you, and i'm gonna be using that argument a lot but uh trust me i'm gonna stick to it Additionally, I'd also love to see this thing being more than just a standard cruiser, which is why I kind of proposed the idea of a multi-mission cruiser Warbird, which is not a thing currently in Star Trek Online. In fact, there are only three multi-mission cruisers in, in total in Star Trek Online. Well, technically four, but one of them is just the fleet version to the Clark, so it's basically three. But yeah, I feel like, you know, just giving the Dideridex a hangar bay kind of makes sense given how freaking huge it is. Now, I'm sure some will argue that it should be a flight deck carrier instead, but while the Dideridex is huge, keep in mind how much of that is just empty space. So I feel like one hangar bay fits it just fine. Yes, I know there are two technically on the model, but you know, shut up. So yeah, beyond that, I uh, just gave it a fight through weapons layout, because like I said, wingspan. Uh, tweaked up the seating a little bit to fit in with the new mastery uh, selections that I gave it, and boom. Now, the Valdor is a little trickier because we never really saw the Valdor do all that much, just due to the fact that it had so a few, it's had so a few appearances in Star Trek so far. Its first appearance was in Star Trek Nemesis, where all we really saw it do was shoot a lot of disruptors and then one of them got blown up by the scimitar. And its only other appearance was in Star Trek Lower Decks, and in that episode, it was only in a holodeck simulation, so it's really kind of tough to call that one an uh, uh, authentic portrayal of the Valdor. In fact, I even added uh, this uh, sail portion in that Lower Decks episode to really kind of uh, move for you know, really emphasize the vibe of this isn't technically a real ship, but maybe it could be. Who knows? But overall, I feel like the legendary Valdor really does capture the feel of this ship pretty authentically. I know it's capturing the vibe more of the Lower Decks version than the version that we saw in Star Trek Nemesis, but I, I, it works. I mean, yeah, you could argue like swapping out the uh, uh, the temporal special, these temporal specialization for Intel or something like that probably would have been more authentic to like the base version of the of the Valdor. But frankly, I like the Lower Decks version better. So yeah, honestly, Legendary Valdor captures the vibe of the Valdor class just fine for me, but I can see why people would would say uh, swap out Temporal for Intel. But honestly, beyond that, I still don't think it would need any more changes beyond that. The Scimitar. This is another one where I feel like they really nailed the feel of the ship with the Legendary version. You know, that thing is a, uh, uh, it's an Intel ship. It's got a secondary uh, command seat on it, so you can do energy weapons or you can use uh, do torpedo builds on it. It's got a hangar bay. Uh, even though we never saw it actually launch the Scorpion fighters, you can still use the Scorpion fighters on it. Uh, then they also gave it the Romulan Hollow drones for some reason. That, uh, that, I guess that was just an excuse to get those in somewhere, but I mean, they're, they're still fun to have. Uh, it, the only note I really have on this ship is that I would love for them to rework the Thaleron weapon uh, that is part of the of the scimitar because as it is right now, it's just part of a console set. It has a really long charge up time and it really only has super niche use beyond, you know, just casual space Barbie stuff. If you really want to use that thing seriously, it's not, you know, you really have to have a very particular setup 
for that to work up because of how long the charge up time is. Personally, I would love to see the Thaleron weapon uh, reworked into a sort of innate weapon, something akin to a Spinal Lance or a Juggernaut Array, more so a Juggernaut Array because, you know, it would have more of a, an area of effect kind of deal going on. But, you know, keep up the keep the charge up effect, but kind of shorten the timer on it. Uh, remove the, uh, uh, the rooting effect that keeps you holding still while it's being activated and, you know, adjust the damage for, uh, for just for the sake of balance. But yeah, I feel like it would be more fun to make that as like, uh, sort of, a sort of juggernaut array effect rather than being a console uh, set bonus. But beyond that, the uh, like I said, the legendary scimitar totally fits the vibe. No notes beyond that. The Hapax Warbird. Now, honestly, this one probably shouldn't be on this list. It's not really a hero ship because it is a Star Trek Online original. You do kind of see it performing sort of a flagship esque role in like the early parts of the uh, of the Romulan story arc in Star Trek Online. But beyond that, this is it's a very dated cruiser warbird in Star Trek Online. It's never really gotten any sort of attention since Legacy of Romulus, and then the when the T six version came out. But yeah, beyond that, it hasn't really done anything super special but i've always loved the look of this thing and i've always felt that this was a better candidate to be the romulan republic flagship than the scimitar was the scimitar being the flagship always seemed like a weird choice to me but yeah whatever that's a different rant uh altogether but i felt like this one was worth pointing out uh i'm not gonna go into super into a huge amount of detail on it mostly because i actually already have a full theory craft video on what i would love to see done as like a rework for this so uh go check that out Moving on to the Klingon ships, first we got the D7 slash Katinga, because, I mean, they're both kind of the same ship on the same skeleton. But yeah, uh, again, we got another one where the, uh, the the legendary version really does fit the vibe. And But again, there is still an argument where you could change up the specialization seating. Uh, I know I'm sure a lot of people would argue that a command seat would really work well on this one. But again, that's kind of true for all the ships on this list honestly but uh you know the uh the intel miracle worker combo on on the legendary version i feel like fits this ship just fine yeah it's not that big of a deal plus it's a battle cruiser with a 5-3 layout yeah i just, i have no notes beyond that the Borel class bird of prey the ship has never really gotten the treatment it truly deserved in Star Trek Online. It was, the legendary version was introduced in the 11th anniversary bundle, and it was absolutely the biggest disappointment out of that entire bundle, only having a 4-2 uh, a weapons layout uh, and being a full Intel... Sh it, no, it wasn't full Intel. It was a uh, full pilot uh, with a secondary Intel seat, which the seating, it wasn't really the big issue with that thing. It was the lousy weapons layout. 4-2 is just, it, it was a ridiculous thing to put on a legendary ship. Frankly, the stats that the Eagle Pilot Raider got, I feel like were much better suited to the Klingon Bird of Prey because that thing it had, it had an enhanced battle cloak. It was, a, it was still a pilot ship, which I does, I do feel like do, uh, it does fit the Burrell pretty nicely. But that also had a secondary Lieutenant Commander command seat, so you could do a torpedo build on it, or you could do like suppression barrage or something like that. But mainly with the torpedo build, you could do like a stealthy torpedo build and totally capture the whole vibe that the Bird of Prey has in Star Trek VI. It, Felt like such a no-brainer to me, and they just completely missed the mark with the legendary Burrell. Of course, since the eagle is already a thing, I can't just, you know, take the stats for that and put it on the onto the Burrell. I mean, I guess I could. This is just a theorycraft video. This ship isn't actually going to exist, so I'm just, you know, making up crap in my head right now. So I guess I could just do that. But I l also liked the idea of using a secondary temporal seat instead, mostly because... Star Trek 4. I mean, there was an entire movie about the ship going back in time to the 80s to rescue some, rescue some whales. But yeah, temporal seat or command seat definitely works better for the uh, the, the Burrell better than an Intel seat. Because, yeah, you could argue for the Intel seat because, oh, it's got a cloaking device. It used to be all sneaky and stuff. Uh, but, you know, it there was literally a whole movie about it going back in time to save some whales. And then uh, another movie where we see it being used by General Chang to stealthily fire torpedoes at the Enterprise and the Excelsior. And then later on Deep Space Nine, we see General Martok use a bird of prey as his command ship in the Dominion War. But yeah, only other note is that it needs a 5-1 weapons layout because 4-2 or 4-3 on an escort. Honestly, that's even worse than a 4-4 on a cruiser at this point in, in the game. So, yeah, 5-1. The reason it only has 5-1 is because it would still have the the Raider Mastery Package, so it would thus have uh, Raider flanking. Because again, Raider, I feel like, really does still fit the Bird of Prey, which is why it also has a crap ton of universal seating, because that's what Raiders have. But yeah, I, I like this set setup a lot better than what we got with the Legendary Bird of Prey. Anyway, enough ranting about that one. Legendary Vorcha, again, this is an yet another one. This is, I know this is kind of a recurring theme here, but this is another one where I feel like the Legendary version really does 
uh, kind of nail the feel of the uh, Vorcha itself. Again, because we never really saw the ship do all that much beyond just kind of show up and occasionally fight, but mostly it just kind of sat across from the uh, the Enterprise D looking menacing. The only real thing I would change about the legendary version is that uh, it has a uh, a command miracle worker set up, and the secondary miracle worker seat is on a lieutenant universal seat. But the ship also has a lieutenant commander universal seat, and I would love to move that miracle worker seat up to the lieutenant commander universal seat. Uh, the only other note I have is it's weird calling it a support battle cruiser because. Klingons never seem like the big support ship type, but I, I, I know why they named it a support ship, because it was released at the same time as the the T-6 Ambassador class. And it's it, old stow rules, which are weird and don't make sense anymore in the game. And honestly, didn't make that didn't make that much sense to begin with. But, you know, whatever. The Negvar class, the first ship on this list to not currently have a legendary version in Star Trek Online. I, I know a lot of people are really opinionated on how they want this ship to be, but personally, I really think that this should be a temporal ship, mostly because it was first introduced in All Good Things in an alternate future. I know technically that wasn't the Negvar. It was, you know, it, it didn't have like the lower nacelles and the, the front bit was a little different, but it was basically the Negvar. It was based off the Negvar. Don't, don't, don't um actually me about it. Yeah, temporal primary, and again, you could really argue for any specialization for the secondary, but I went with Miracle Worker just because Miracle Worker really hasn't been used as a secondary in this video all that much. In fact, it still won't be. I'm only going to use it like one more time, I think. You could argue for command, but honestly, command's really getting overused a lot in this video, so I didn't want to use command. Same with it, same with Intel. That one's getting a lot of use in this video, too, so I felt like Miracle Worker was a good setup. And honestly, Miracle Worker uh, Temporal is not a common uh, setup, especially with Temporal as the primary. This is not a, a super common uh, pairing for specializations, so I felt like, you know, the, just to keep it interesting, I felt like that was a good way to go. Uh, again, 5-3 weapons layout. Again, look at the wingspan. Every, you know, every weapon hardpoint visible on the ship is pointing forward. It should have a 5-3 layout. And lastly, on this one, I really wanted to get away with get away from the battlecruiser designation for this thing because, especially with the Klingon ships, battlecruiser gets overused a lot. I mean, heck, look at the other uh, Klingon ships on this list: the uh, the D seven, uh, the Vorcha, and then the next one on the list, which is the the Bortosk, the legendary version of that one, is a uh, is a battlecruiser. So it would be nice to get away from the battlecruiser designation, but at the same time, I can't think of a. Uh, uh, a designation that fits it better, so I just left it as uh, Battlecruiser. I know some would argue for Dreadnought or Juggernaut, but honestly, I feel like either of those suits the Bortosk better. Because honestly, the uh, the legendary Bortosk really does fit the vibe of the actual Bortosk fairly well, in my opinion, but the only downside to it is that they made it a Battlecruiser which never really made sense to me, especially when you look at the other legendary flagships. Look at the uh, legendary Odyssey. That was a Dreadnought. Legendary Scimitar. I mean, all the Scimitars, actually. Those are uh, uh, those are Dreadnoughts, technically. But they went ahead and made the legendary Bortosk a battlecruiser for some reason. It's It never made sense to me. I feel like Dreadnought really fits the vibe of this thing better. Because one, it's freaking huge. And two, it's actually got visible hangar bays here on the model, which is a detail you don't see on a lot of Klingon ships. Uh, so it, it's 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 kind of funny to me that they went to, they went through the uh, 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 the work of putting that in there and then didn't, didn't use them. You could also argue for Juggernaut for the Bortosk. In fact, I think I actually did that in a, a past video once, which I would also I think would be really interesting uh, just to, uh, to, again, change things up. And, you know, a Klingon Juggernaut is definitely a very Klingon thing to do, so I feel like that would have worked for this ship too, but I feel like more people would be happy with uh, Dreadnought just for the hangar bay. Speaking of Dreadnoughts, let's move on to the only Jem'Hadar ship on this list, the Jem'Hadar Dreadnought, which, you know, that, that's... Jem'Hadar naming convention is very boring. <laughs> it's, just, it's literally just Jem'Hadar Dreadnought, Jem'Hadar attack ship, Jem'Hadar cruiser. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, this one... It, it, Despite not having a, a huge amount of appearances throughout Deep Space Nine, this has always been a very popular ship, mostly just because it's freaking huge, I guess. And it was it, it was introduced in a really cool episode, but we never got to see it all that much uh, throughout uh, Deep Space Nine. I feel like that's why we got a legendary attack ship before we got a legendary version of this. But I feel like there is a lot of people who would still be really into a legendary version of the Dreadnought, especially considering the versions, at least one of the versions of this ship in the game, are actually... It's actually really cool, the Dreadnought Carrier, and um, there's also the the Vanguard Dreadnought, which uh, 
while those ships cannot be kit bashed together, I feel like I mean, they look visually very similar. And the fact that they were able to kit bash the um, the the Jem'Hadar attack ship and the Vanguard attack ship, the legendary version, I feel like they'd be uh, able to do those together too because they look very similar. They're pretty much the same size. I, they look like they were designed to be kit bashable together, and I don't understand why they currently aren't. Anyway, uh, the thinking behind here is just to kind of take the, the T6 Jem'Hadar Dreadnought Carrier and the Vanguard Dreadnought and just kind of mesh them together, which was actually very easy because the two are already pretty similar uh, because they're both Jem'Hadar ships. One's just a normal Dreadnought. One is a Dreadnought Carrier, which are fairly similar. Really, the main difference is going to be in the seating there and the, you know, the second hangar bay. Uh, and the weapons layout, so I guess they're pretty different, but they're similar enough. But the other similarity between these two ships was the the, uh, the command seat, all of which uh, they they only have command seating. None of them are full spec, but the uh, the Jem'Hadar Dreadnought has uh, a a lieutenant commander command seat, and the uh, the Dreadnought carrier has a lieutenant commander and a lieutenant level command seat. It's a, a lot of command seat. I didn't replicate that though. I I put Intel as the secondary because double command that's that's just too com that's that's a little too much command. Uh, so uh, I, I guess you could argue to keep the uh, the second command seat if you really wanted to. There are some situations where it would be kind of in kind of nice to have. Uh, but yeah, I felt like the the command Intel combo would serve this ship better. Uh, I wanted to keep it as a Dreadnought Carrier, just to make it more interesting. I mean, Dreadnoughts are cool, but there's a lot of them in the game at this point. Dreadnought Carrier... I mean, the, the, uh, in fact, uh, the this was the first Dreadnought Carrier ever introduced into the game, I believe. The first playable one, uh, back when uh, th this was one of the earliest T5 uh, uh, promo or lockbox ships. I forget which one it was, but yeah, the... Uh, it was a very popular ship because of, uh, because of that, but yeah, it was... I wanted to keep that identity of it being a dreadnought carrier, and plus it's you know, being able to have this giant Dominion ship launching out uh, smaller uh, Jem'Hadar attack ships. It's just fun, and to re further reinforcement, further reinforce that feeling, uh, give it the Vanguard mechanic because you know it may as well be a, a Vanguard ship, and you know the 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 Vanguard. Uh, wingman ship mechanic is definitely like one of the most fun mechanics in Star Trek Online in my opinion so I would not want to release another uh, Dominion ship without that so you really want to keep that with it yeah uh, beyond that uh, the pretty similar t uh, seating to the original T6 Dreadnought carrier just tweaked up the uh, uh, or altered the uh, uh, specialization seating to make it match what I picked here but overall I, I feel like this would be a really uh, really much more authentic version of the uh the the Gemidar Dreadnought carrier. I uh, sort of I guess you you could argue technically it was called a battleship or a, yeah it was called a battleship in um uh Deep Space Nine. So technically you could argue for it just being a battle cruiser and then take away the hangar bays. But um like I said in the uh, the Federation video, I feel like if you start taking away hangar bays, people will riot. So uh we'll we'll leave we'll leave it as a uh, Dreadnought carrier. And lastly is a ship that has not gotten enough attention, I think, and that is the Galore slash the Keldon. I mean, technically they are different ships, but they're on the same skeleton, so it's the, the, the Galore. Uh, this also doesn't have a legendary ship, and technically it doesn't qualify for a legendary ship status because Cardassians are not a playable faction. They are a playable race, but they are just a part of the, uh, the Federation or Klingons if you buy them out of the sea store. But given that the Galore was such a huge staple throughout Star Trek Deep Space Nine, I feel like it is deserving of a legendary version or some type of re-release to make the, the Galore slash Keldon more interesting. Uh, so I would, uh, you know, I, I kept it as an Intel ship, or I actually bumped it up to a full Intel ship. The, uh, the original one just has a, uh, lieutenant, has two lieutenant commander, not two lieutenant, a lieutenant commander and a lieutenant level, uh, Intel seat. So it is double Intel, which is a weird theme throughout all of the, uh, uh, all the playable Cardassian ships in the game. Literally every single one of them is double Intel, which I wanted to break with, so I gave it a, uh, a Miracle Worker secondary, because again, I haven't used Miracle Worker as a secondary all that much in this video, so it seemed appropriate. It still fits the vibe, you still want to do like an energy weapon build on this with uh, Intel and Miracle Worker is just going to further buff that. Yeah, uh, the original one is fairly engineering heavy, and actually I made it a little more engineering heavy, but uh, I feel like that kind of fits with the vibe with the uh, with the galore because they're constantly trying to... Because, again, the Cardassians are constantly trying to keep up with the Federation, so they're constantly trying to engineer stuff to keep them... Uh, 
uh, keep them going, but at the same time, they're constantly taking shortcuts. Uh, like they skip a lot of the uh, uh, the safety uh, regulations that the Federation ships would have. So I feel like the engineering stuff uh, kind of works for it. But to balance that out, you put all the specialization seating on there so it doesn't become overburdened with engineering stuff. I did the same thing on the um, the the Negvar too, by the way. I think I forgot to mention that. But yeah, I feel like it's a setup that works for this sort of cruiser where you expect it to be like kind of tanky, kind of engineering, kind of kind of dopey in certain ways. You want a ship to be kind of dopey, you put a bunch of engineering seating on it. But if you don't want that ship to be completely useless, you put all the intel, you put all the uh, specialization seating on the engineering seating to, you know, to balance it out. So yeah, that's how I would fix the non-Federation hero ships in Star Trek Online to make them feel more authentic to the shows and movies. Let me know what you guys thought of this down below in the comments. I'm sure you all have opinions, just like with the last video. And while you're down there, be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for notifications. If you'd like to further support the channel, you can hit that join button to become a member, or you can find the link to the merch store down in the description. Or if you are ever shopping on the Epic Game Store, be sure to use my content creator code STU1701. Any of those really help me out, and I really do appreciate that. Either way, though, thank you so much for watching. My name's Stu, and I will see you guys next time.